All right. Welcome to another macro discussion. This time around, we're going to talk about China. And in this presentation, we will go over the Biden Xi call last Friday, the crash in the Chinese stock market, the Sino Russian trade, China's opportunities from Russian sanctions, and lastly, the emergence of the yuan as a reserve currency. And without further ado, here it is in focus tonight. This is a point of no return. It is a new world order. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the wall of worry for financial markets and the economy. Now, in previous episodes, we talked about Russia in details. We went over the importance of the gas pipelines before the war started, and then we went over the impacts of sanctions on the Russian economy and the upcoming default. We also talked about the impact of Russian sanctions on the global economy. We also talked in details about Wall Street's entanglements in Russia, which are worth over a hundred billion dollars. In this video, however, I want to talk about China because it is becoming an active item in the wall of worry rapidly. Friday, Presidents Biden and Xi had a phone call, and rumor has it the phone call was too long, over two hours. Why did it take too long? Here's why. Rumor has it that President Biden was taking a lot of naps during the conversation, and it went like this. Uh, Mr. President, Xi just replied to you. You might want to answer. Huh? Come on, man. Stop jerking around. Donna Lipa answered my text. No, 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 Mr. President, this is Xi as in Xi Jinping, the president of China, and he just answered your question, and he's awaiting your response. Oh, come on, man. Gotta go back to sleep. Let Kamala handle all of this. Ah, uh, Mr. President, Vice President Kamala Harris, she's not available, and it would be an insult to President Xi of China. Hello, Mr. President? And it went on like this for a while, so it is no wonder why the phone call took over two hours. But, of course, our media was watching CNN, and the banner read, Biden warns Xi Jinping. He warned China. He's a tough guy. And, of course, this is all bullshit. They're playing politics. He did not warn shit, because the story that we got from China was quite different. Turns out that China's Xi told Biden that the state-to-state -state relationships cannot advance to the stage of confrontation. And on top of that, the Chinese vice foreign minister right away blamed NATO for the war in Ukraine. And then came out the foreign minister and said that China is on the right side of history over the Ukraine war. He also added, China will never accept any external coercion of pressure and opposes any unfounded accusation and suspicions against China. And then we found out that President Xi of China told Joe Biden that improper handling of the Taiwan issues will hit China-US ties, which are collapsing, by the way, because we don't have good ties with China to begin with. We caught a few uh, agents of China trying to intimidate a Chinese-American from New York running for Congress right now. On top of that, we have the SEC, you know, the dormant in a coma organization we call the SEC. Well, the SEC already threatened to ban 250 Chinese companies out of the stock market, delisting, goodbye. And the pressure was on for a long time against Chinese stocks. From the scams, the fraud, the manipulation of financial results, and a lot of market observers, specifically in the short traders community, been warning for a long time, over and over and over, that there is high degree of risk in Chinese stocks. And I was among them. Unfortunately, a lot of retail investors and traders here in the US and across the globe did not heed the warning, and they're now holding a massive bag of losses in Chinese stocks. And then came the double whammy, another shoe that dropped on the Chinese stock market, this time around from the rise of the cases of the thing over in China. We saw a massive historic sell-off in the Chinese equities market. Matter of fact, right now, the Nasdaq Golden Dragon Index, which tracks Chinese stocks, almost wiped out 13 years worth of gains. Poof gone. The rise of cases of the thing over in China prompted school shutdowns, factory shutdowns in Shenzhen, Shanghai. It also halted production in factories for Apple and Toyota and many other major manufacturers. And of course, we're seeing a massive surge in cases in China due to massive testing. If you're going to test millions, if not billions of people rapidly, you're going to get cases. Whether these cases are serious or not, that's a different story. But for now, China is adopting the zero case policy. 
which is proving to be more difficult said than done. And of course, it's all fun and games until the oligarchs start to lose a few billions. And in the beginning of this week, Chinese billionaires lost $53 billion in a day. Poof. Gone. And when the billionaires start to lose money, the CCP gets a little nervous. So now Xi Jinping comes down and says that China should take more effective COVID measures, minimizing the economic and social impact. Okay, and then came China on Wednesday with the intervention, saying that they will not allow Chinese stocks to crash. They will support the stock market with whatever they need to do. And boom, Chinese equities rebounded significantly higher, erasing pretty much all of the gains and then some. Because as you can see, for a long time, Chinese equities held the premium over US equities, Chinese equities, the Dragon Index in red, the S&P 500 in black. And that premium collapsed recently. Matter of fact, Chinese stocks went into deep discount territory for a brief moment this week, and hence the technical rebound. The problem is, is this a precursor to what's about to come in the US equities market? Will the US market also collapse, just like we saw the Chinese stock market collapsing? Because after all, our entire economy, our corporate profits highly depend on China. And if China goes down, so will the US market. In other words, the Chinese economy is too big to fail. And right now, all in all, when you factor in inflation, the money supply from China actually went negative for the first time in decades. And I know that there is talk out there that China is actually easing the monetary policy because they're cutting interest rates. The problem is, yes, they're cutting interest rates, but all in all, the money supply is down for the first time in decades. So all in all, when you factor in inflation, this is not easing in the financial conditions. If anything, this is a desperate measure to rescue an economy that is falling apart. And hence, the interest rate cuts. We're all aware about Evergrande and the real estate crisis in China, and now we have the rise of inflation with soaring commodities prices. And we know that China is highly dependent on imports of commodities from across the globe. So these soaring prices are having a negative impact on the Chinese economy. So what do you resort to when your economy is falling apart? How about manipulation just like we do here in the United States? Because China never missed a GDP estimate until now, and they missed to the upside, above estimate, as if somebody grabbed a sharpie and just pushed that line above the estimate, saying, hey, there's nothing to see here, don't worry, the Chinese economy is still growing rapidly. Oh, really? The point being here is, the Chinese economy is already outchained from a slowdown in growth and an exodus, a mass exodus from foreign investors out of Chinese equities. And then came another shoe that dropped in the Chinese economy, the Russia-Ukraine war, because it's going to cost China a dire price. The Chinese economy will be damaged severely from its ties with the Russian economy, as I will show you right now. But, there was also an opportunity for China to emerge as the winner from this war and from the sanctioning that's going on right now. We will also talk about that in this video. But let's talk about the Sino-Russian trade because just before the war, Presidents Putin and Xi Jinping signed a $117.5 billion trade deal between the two countries, solidifying the economic ties between China and Russia. And of course, this is a strategic deal between the two countries. Russia was looking for backing for its invasion of Ukraine, and who is better than China, the second superpower in the globe? China was looking for sweetheart deals from Russia, a commodities giant, and not to mention a nuclear giant. Beijing supported Russia's demand that Ukraine should not be admitted into NATO, as the Kremlin amasses 100,000 troops near its neighbor. This is, of course, before the invasion happened. While Moscow opposed any form of independence for Taiwan, as global powers jostle over the spheres of influence. Friendship between the two states has no limits. There are no forbidden areas of cooperation, the two countries said in a joint statement. And this is important because it says there are no forbidden areas of cooperation be it economic or militarily. Beijing has declined to join Western countries in condemning what Moscow calls a special military operation, while also calling for restraint on all sides. Sino Russian trade surged 35% in 2021 to $146.9 billion. Chinese customs data show, and this is a trend likely to be turbocharged by sweeping new sanctions that cut Russia from Western markets. 
A shift in trade flows has been brewing since Russia's annexation of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014, said Tom James, the chief executive of Trade Flow Capital Management in Singapore. And listen to this. Russia has already started trading in renminbi with China, adding that banks can deal with each other outside the SWIFT network, from which Moscow is now blocked, and Beijing could benefit greatly, though not without risks. Just over a quarter of Chinese exports to Russia were settled in Yuan in the first half of 2021, up from just 2%. This is a massive jump from 2% in 2013 to almost 25% in 2021, as both countries seek to cut reliance on the U.S. dollar. Asked about the risks Beijing might face if it provides economic help to Moscow, including sanction blowback, China's foreign ministry told Reuters in a statement, China and Russia will continue to carry out normal economic and trade cooperation in a spirit of mutual respect, equality, and mutual benefit. And when we talk about mutual benefit, there is a lot where that comes from, because, as you can see, the total value of trade between China and Russia almost doubled since two. 2015, around $70 billion a year, to now closer to $150 billion a year. China is stand to lose a lot if Russia loses. If the Russian economy collapses, China will feel a lot of pain. Because since 2015, in the closer ties between China and Russia, Chinese imports from Russia expanded dramatically. Look at coal, palladium, crude, copper, natural gas, wheat, all went significantly higher as a percentage of total Chinese imports. Nickel went down because China's colonizing Indonesia by financing all of these nickel mining projects that nobody wanted to finance due to the environmental impact of deforestation and dumping all of that mining waste right into the coral reefs. Anyways, here are the details of the trade expansion between China and Russia since 2017. Exports of Russian oil and gas to China have steadily increased. Russia is China's second biggest oil supplier after Saudi Arabia, with volumes averaging 1.59 million barrels per day last year, or 15.5% of Chinese imports. About 40% of the supplies flow via the 2,540-mile East Siberia Pacific Ocean Pipeline that was financed by $50 billion in Chinese loans. You think the Chinese will be happy if the Russian economy defaults and that $50 billion goes poof, gone? Think again. Russia is also Beijing's number three gas supplier, exporting 16.5 billion cubic meters of fuel to China in 2021, meeting about 5% of Chinese demand. Supplies via the Power of Siberia pipeline, which is not connected to the network of westbound Russian gas pipelines, began in late 2019 and are due to rise to 38 billion cubic meter a year by 2025. Listen to this, up from 10.5 billion cubic meters in 2021, under a 30-year contract worth more than 4 hundred billion dollars. You really think China's gonna let Russia default? Think again. Here is the expansion of the pipelines. A lot of pipelines go from Russia to China, and now they're expanding those pipelines under a 30-year contract. So all of this fantasy that Russia is gonna collapse and the sanctions are working, no they're not. The war is still going on, and China will not let the Russian economy collapse. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars that China is set to lose if Russia collapses. What about food? Russia's food trade with China is small but expanding. In 2019, China allowed the import of soybeans from all regions in Russia. And the two countries signed a deal to deepen cooperation in soybean supply chains, which saw more Chinese firms growing the beans in Russia. This is highly important. China imports their soybeans from multiple countries, Argentina, Brazil, but also the United States. And now we're seeing Russia as a substitute for China's food security. Again. You think China's just gonna watch Russia collapsing? Think again. Soybean exports to China stood at 543,058 tons last year and are expected to reach 3.7 million tons by 2024. In 2021, China approved beef imports from Russia, while last Friday it allowed imports of wheat from all regions of Russia. Other food exports from Russia to China include fish, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, 
poultry, wheat flour, and chocolate. China is also a huge buyer of timber from Russia's Far East, with imports of timber and related products worth $4.1 billion last year. Now, make no mistake, China is also set to lose from the destruction of the Ukrainian economy and the restrictions of moving Ukrainian products out of the country due to the war. China had booked up to 2 million tons of Ukrainian corn imports for this year. But most of those shipments are now in jeopardy, given the disruption to Ukraine's logistic chains. To replace those volumes, this is important, listen to this, China is expected to import around 3 million tons of broken rice, up from about 2 million tons annually in the past two years. Why rice? It is a substitute of corn. Instead of using corn to feed the livestock, you gotta use rice. So we're now seeing rice prices exploding higher. One importer in Guangdong is looking to buy broken rice from Thailand, while others have recently bought Indian broken rice for feed, according to another source briefed on the matter. And here's my prediction, by the way. Expect India and China to get a little closer. They have problems, but these sanctions against Russia are alienating both China and India from the United States. So my expectations are, since these two countries are heavily reliant on imports of commodities and they will suffer tremendously from the rise in prices of commodities, my hunch is we will see China and India growing closer together again. Demand for Indian broken rice has gone up because of higher corn prices. Feed makers are trying to replace corn with rice. Prices of 100% Indian broken rice have moved up from 320 bucks per ton this month from 290 bucks in February. And here's why China will have no other alternative for now besides India, and hence the warming of relations between China and India. Thailand is a no-go for now because further underpinning rice prices, feed makers in Thailand are also looking at using more broken rice to replace corn, pushing up domestic prices across the country, said Bangkok-based traders. Now, as you can see, broken rice been exploding for a while. It has a premium, always has, over wheat and corn, but look at what wheat and corn are doing right now. They're catching up to rice, so if you cannot find corn, corn or wheat and you're going to pay more for them anyways, you might as well buy rice. And guess what's also going on? China is buying more corn from the United States this time around. After signing the trade deal with Russia, Chinese imports of corn from the United States dropped like a rock. And then the war started and the Chinese went back to the US market to buy corn. Now ask yourself a question. For China's food security, is this what Xi Jinping wants to see? Of course not. He doesn't want to empower the United States and its farmers by buying corn from here. He is heavily invested in Russia for China's future food security. And this is perhaps the most important part when we talk about the Sino-Russian trade relationship. Russia is by far Beijing's largest recipient of state sector financing, securing 107 loans and export credits worth $125 billion from Chinese state institutions between 2000 and 2017. Folks, we're talking about $100 billion here, $400 billion there. China is set to lose a lot if the Russian economy collapses, they're not just going to sit there and watch that happen. China and Russia began using their own currencies to settle bilateral trade in 2010 and opened their first currency swipe line in 2014, which they renewed in 2020 for 150 billion yuan over three years. Yuan settlements accounted for 28% of Chinese exports to Russia in the first half of 2021, compared with just 2% in 2013, as both countries seek to ease reliance on the dollar while developing their own respective cross-border payment systems. The Chinese currency accounted for 13.1% of the Russian central bank's foreign currency reserves in June 2021, compared with just 0.1% in June 2017. That is a Massive increase. And listen to this with Moscow's dollar holdings dropping to 16.4% from 46.3% in the same period. So far, we talked about the Chinese entanglements in the Russian economy, and they're worth billions and billions and billions of dollars, a multi-decade worth of deals. And the big question we must ask is, will the Chinese just sit idle and watch the Russian economy collapsing? I doubt it. But what if they do interfere? and rescue the Russian economy. What will be the response then? Because we obviously have a lot to lose in China versus Russia, and this war and the sanctions open a massive opportunity for China to emerge as the winner from all of this conflict. How? Number one, replacing Western firms in Russia. Number two, making the yuan a reserve currency, challenging the US dollar. 
Chinese firms are already licking their chops, waiting to replace all of these Western firms that abandoned Russia. Of course, the Russians for now say they will nationalize all of these assets of Western companies that abandoned Russia. But the Chinese want these assets and they want to replace them. While Russia is a small tech market by global standards, it accounts for about 2% of global smartphone and PC shipments. It is Europe's largest phone market and a competitive tech battleground where Western brands vie with Chinese rivals for top billing. On Wednesday, the Chinese state-run newspaper Global Times published an article describing an opportunity for Chinese smartphone and automobile companies in Russia following the departure of their U.S. rivals. The article has since been taken down. Chinese companies controlled about 41% of the Russian smartphone market last year according to CounterPoint Research. They include Xiaomi and other fast-growing brands, Honor Devices, and Realme, whatever that is, and they're all eyeing to replace Apple's departure. Apple's decision to suspend sales potentially puts its 14% share of the market up for grabs. The companies did not respond to requests for comment. Again, are they just going to sit idle or are they going to recapture 14% market share in Russia? This will be a massive opportunity for Chinese rivals to capture the Russian market entirely. And this abandonment from U.S. firms to the Russian market just pulling out abruptly is sending alarm bells across many other countries in the Middle East, in Africa, in India, in South America that they could be next. They could be the United States enemy next for whatever reason. And they're set to lose a lot if they get sanctioned by the United States and we see Western firms pulling out of these countries. And this is a massive opportunity for China to expand its economic sphere of influence. And this could create a new China-led trade bloc. Have you noticed that everything we've been doing so far goes to benefit China? I wonder why. And here is the crown jewel for China from all of this fiasco. Making the Chinese currency, the yuan, a reserve currency, and by doing that, dethroning the United States dollar as the reserve currency of the world. Credit Suisse, Posar, says commodities crisis could weaken euro dollar, boosts yuan. What is he talking about? China's central bank is uniquely placed to backstop a global commodities crisis sparked by sanctions imposed in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, potentially paving the way for much stronger yuan, Credit Swiss investment strategist said. In a note published on Monday, Zoltan Posar, the global head of the bank's short-term interest rate strategy, said the unfolding crisis in Ukraine had led to a perfect storm, quote-unquote, in commodities that could weaken the euro-dollar system, contributing to inflation in Western economies and threaten financial stability. Western central banks held back by sanctions imposed by their own governments will not be able to provide support such as emergency liquidity needed to close market gaps. He also added that the People's Bank of China faced no such restrictions. And listen to this. Posar said selling U.S. treasuries to fund vessel leasing and purchases of cheap Russian commodities will help the PBOC control inflation in China, while leading to commodities shortages, recession, and higher yields in Western economies. Da -da -da -da. We haven't seen the nuclear moves, economically speaking. We're not talking about the actual nuclear, hopefully not. But the economic nuclear option in Russia's position right now, what if they cut gas supplies to Germany 100%? Gone. No more gas supplies. You will see European economies collapsing right away. And then China has a nuclear economic button, which is doing this, dumping U.S. treasuries and then using that money to buy Russian commodities. Cheap. Russian commodities. Now, if China does that, it will have an immense power to scoop up all of these commodities in the global market. And by doing so, they're going to cause a lot of shortages and lack of supply for other buyers with less purchasing power. Russian commodities today are like subprime were in 2008. Conversely, non-Russian commodities are like U.S. Treasury securities were back in 2008. This is a good example. One collapsing in price and the other one surging in price with margin calls on both regardless of which side you're on. This is a nightmare scenario. And here's the important part. When this crisis and war is over, the US dollar should be much weaker. And on the flip side, the RMB much stronger, said Credit Suisse strategist Zoltan Posar in a note outlining a regime shift 
as China buys Russian commodities. Diego Parella, who manages Quadrega Igno, a $150 million fund designed to profit from turmoil, takes a very different view and is wagering that the yuan falls as trade fragments and China prints or borrows more and more to support its economy. This is a possibility, but all in all, there is no return from here. Russia is hitting east, not west. I think globalization as we know it is finished. We are in a de facto bipolar world. Now, as you can see, the composition of official exchange reserves, the yuan is pretty much nowhere to be found. The number one reserve currency in the world is the US dollar, followed by the euro and then yen. But this is about to change, folks. What was the reason behind the US dollar's supremacy in the foreign exchange reserves? The answer is the petrodollar. What is the petrodollar? It is a deal the United States made with Saudi Arabia decades ago. But this deal is also falling apart and China will stand to be the winner. The headline reads, Saudi Arabia reportedly considering accepting yuan instead of dollar for oil sales. Why is this a big deal, by the way? What happens if Saudi Arabia starts trading oil with China based on the yuan instead of the US dollar? Well, you gotta remember, if you wanna buy oil from Saudi Arabia right now, you gotta exchange whatever currency you have to the US dollar and then you buy the oil. And in that deal, the Saudi currency remains static, tied to the US dollar's valuation. It never moves, and that avoids volatility in the Saudi economy. That link was forged in the early 1970s, not long after President Richard Nixon decoupled the dollar from gold. In 1974, Washington and Riyadh struck a deal by which Saudi Arabia could buy U.S. Treasury bills before they were auctioned. In return, Saudi Arabia would sell its oil in dollars, not only enlarging the currency's liquidity, but also using those dollars to buy U.S. debt and products. The political economist David Spiro, in his book The Hidden Hand of American Hegemony, described how Saudi Arabia convinced other OPEC nations to invoice oil in dollars, rather than in a basket of different currencies. If the yuan displaces the dollar to a sufficient degree in the annual $14 trillion global oil trade, although what that sufficient degree would be is difficult to say, countries will have to maintain yuan reserves instead. At the moment, 2.48% of the world's reserves are held in yuan, compared to 55% for the dollar. Oil producers receiving yuan would have to spend it on Chinese debt and imports, further strengthening China's economy. But if the world was particularly awash in yuan, other trade might start to be yuan-dominated. Metals, say, or soybeans. That is the danger. If you have a few countries, let's say Saudi, China, South Africa, Russia, maybe Brazil, all coming together and saying, you know what, we're going to have an alternative commodities market that trades in yuan. Now you have a huge chunk of the global oil trade, the global agricultural trade, the global gas trade, the global metals trade, the global meat trade. If that ever happens, it will shake the supremacy of the U.S. dollar like you have never seen before. And on top of that, Saudi Arabia is now inviting China's Xi to visit Riyadh. All of this sanctioning, all of this stunning response from U.S.-based companies pulling out of Russia scared the Saudis, the Indians, UAE, China, and many other countries that it is time to shift to the East and have an alternative to the U.S. dollar. Some analysts have downplayed the chances of a yuan deal, pointing out that the Saudi real is pegged to the U.S. dollar helping shield its economy from volatility. But the effectiveness of the West's sanctions against Russia has been a wake-up call for countries seeking to reduce their reliance on the U.S., while other regimes worry that they could be next if they cross Washington. A potential deal in Yuan is a sign that the world is looking for some counterweight to the U.S. dollar. One reason Saudi Arabia is considering an oil deal in Yuan is because it would create exposure to a currency other than the dollar and affords the country a Yuan-based hedge. Another factor could be that the Saudis don't anticipate the dollar to be as stable moving forward. You can bet on that for sure, especially if the U.S. increases its money supply in response to economic challenges. We are already at 30 trillion dollars in debt, the Fed's balance sheet exploded higher, trillions and trillions of dollars. You really think the dollar is going to be supreme in the decades to come? Think again. An extreme view would be that it reduces China's vulnerability to sanctions that the West may impose should China do something that the US and its allies oppose. I'm guessing uh, Taiwan. But two things that must happen for China's yuan to establish itself as a reserve currency. First, 
global faith in the dollar would have to wane. This could happen if the Federal Reserve fails to get inflation under control or if it veers from its usual predictability. This is already happening. The Fed is losing to inflation. The Fed is way behind the curve. So yes, faith in the US dollar is being shaken worldwide. Second, China would have to prove the long-term stability of the yuan to win the trust of other nations. But China devalues its currency occasionally to boost exports, aka manipulation. Anyways, and countries won't want to hold a currency like that. So Beijing would have to commit to more responsible policy. Folks, the bottom line from all of this is the following. There was something brewing underneath for so long. The move from the reliance on Western economies, specifically the U.S. economy, the U.S. dollar, U.S. imports, to an alternative. And we knew ahead of time this alternative would be China. And we've been empowering China, by the way. We've been shooting ourselves in the foot for a long time. All of your beloved politicians and beloved corporations, U.S.-based corporations, selling out to China for years and years and years. Now China's becoming an economic superpower, an alternative to the United States and the West. And countries have been noticing that. And countries have been eager for a long time to move away from the U.S. hegemony to an alternative. This Russia-Ukraine war and the sanctions that followed thereafter have awakened the beast. All of that brewing is now coming above the surface. U.S. firms will lose all business in Russia. U.S. firms will start to lose business in China, in India, in Saudi, in Africa, in South America, in other Asian nations, or we might see the rise of the yuan as an alternative reserve currency. That will change everything we've been accustomed to, the U.S. and the West's supremacy over the economic global arena. It will be challenged at some point, dethroned. This is just the beginning. And with that, folks, this is the end of this macro discussion. The technical discussion of the stock market will be coming out this evening. So stick around and you know the deal. Hit a like, subscribe, comment, and let me know what you think. This is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again soon.